Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to our Wednesday live broadcast here at Dr. Beasley's. And uh, today's kind of a fun topic. We're going to be talking about tools. And uh, most people know me as a paint polisher, not a carpet cleaner. And so uh, I'm a big fan of tools. And I'm going to start this out. And we're just going to be, I look up here, I got a lot of tools. We're going to be just rambling through here. But I want to start out with showing my original, my first rotary polisher. This is the Makita. Let's see, the part number is 9207S. PC. This, to my knowledge, was the first variable speed rotary on the market. Before that, they were either one speed or a, they had a high-low switch, a back-and-forth little slider switch like the old Black & Decker's. And the thing I just want to point out is, listen to this, I ran this polisher till I wore out the gears. It'll no longer maintain a pad rotation. And this has a sand cast aluminum head. And over here, where my hand would rub, I've worn that textured sand cast aluminum that coarse texture down smooth like a piece of chrome and i've wore the ribs off the handle and i don't know how many times i've wired in my own cords i had this i buffed so many cars with this thing and i always tell people if you want to take a class on how to learn how to use a rotary polisher you should take one from someone that's actually used one and i can prove it so rotary polisher on my first makita and i'm going to start with rotaries right now so when we talk about all these tools all these tools will get the job done uh, what it really comes down to is um, something that we talked about on one of the Facebook groups. I think it was uh, Detailing for Money. And a longtime good friend of mine, Barry Thill, mentioned my name in a discussion about rotary polishers. And people were talking about which polisher was the best. And I came up and just said, it's not which polisher is the best. It's using the right tool for the job. Okay. Now you add personal preference. You can choose the right tool for the job, or you can use the wrong tool for the job because it's your personal preference. But I always believe in using the right tool for the job. So let's just talk about the rotary polisher. This is the Flex Cordless PE150. This is, and can you zoom in on this? Go ahead and zoom on on this, Craig. Tell me if I'm holding this in the right place. If you look carefully, you can see there's two different colors of red here. This is kind of a light red. This is a more of a maroon red. It's got a funny looking red sticker. This is a prototype. It doesn't even have a serial number. So before they launched this tool uh, in production and introduced to the world, about a year before that, they sent me this. And I can't even count how many cars I've buffed out with this rotary. And the thing about the rotary is because it spins a pad in a circle, especially like a wool pad or a fiber pad, it is the most aggressive, thus the most powerful tool when it comes to removing deeper defects fast. Or also if you sand down a car, like the entire car, and you've got to pull out all your sanding marks, sure you can do with an orbital, but I guarantee you, you're going to get the job done much faster and more effective using a rotary. Now, a lot of people over the years have seen, there's a lot of times there's a hole in the center of the backing plates for these things. And I just want to show you what that's for. This is a brand new uh, wool pad. And this wool pad came with this little cardboard tube. And what you do with that tube, let me show you this, it's kind of a snug fit, is you're supposed to put that tube inside that hole and that's an alignment dowel, kind of like if you're putting a bell housing on the back of an engine, if you've ever done that before. Then you just take simply and line up the hole here, slide that on and you just centered, just centered your pad. And probably the most important thing you can do when you're using a wool pad on a rotary polisher is to center that pad and make sure it's true. If it's not, it's kind of like, I'll show you, <laughs> it's kind of like a big orbital. But it'd be like going down the road in a car with a flat tire, womp, womp, womp. It, it won't buff smooth. It won't buff easy. It's going to wear you out. And it ain't going to, uh, it's, ain't, it's not going to remove defects in a very uniform way because only portions of the pad are touching at one time. So take all the time it takes to center that up. And then a little tip I show is once you got it, look, I just did that without the tube. So I've been doing this for a while. Take a Sharpie marker and just uh, mark the back. And then when you take this off, see the circle? That'll make it faster to, re to reinstall this and get it centered up. Anyway, that's one of my tips for that. And then when you're cleaning these, I see a lot of guys use a screwdriver. Don't be that guy. Get a, get a spur, and usually what you do is you kind of lock this against your leg, and then run that in and out, and that's how you clean that pad is with the spur. What happens if you use a screwdriver is it'll find a sweet spot where it likes to kind of hang out, and you'll start digging a trough in there. You will shine up your screwdriver, but <laughs> it's not the way, right way to do it. Anyway, rotary polisher. Um, I also show a lot of people how to attach a brush like this and use it to machine scrub tires. 
body cladding, uh, non-skid in boats, about anything that you can scrub with the hand brush, you can machine scrub. I did a set of spoke wheels the other day ago. And then uh, nowadays I show people how to apply a tire dressing with the same brush. Clean the brush first, put the dressing on with like a paintbrush, and then work it in. And it really does a good job of working the dressing into all the nooks and crannies, all the lettering, and what's called siping. Siping are the lines sometimes you see on the sidewall of a tire. So rotary polisher, super effective tool. Um, I post a lot of pictures of the cars I buff out, and a lot of times you see me using rotary, and it's because so many of the cars that come in here are so packed up. They look like they've been used as a hockey puck that sure, I could fix it with an orbital. It's just going to take longer. So I just nail it. I just get in and get out. So I use a wool pad on rotary. And then the key about that is as long as you're using good abrasive technology, what that means is the holograms you're going to leave behind because you are going to leave holograms, but they're only giving you the, sh the thickness or the the depth of the fibers cutting the paint, okay? So it's not like they're real deep holograms because if you're because if you use good abrasive technology, if you use bad abrasive technology, what we call rocks in a bottle, now you've got the fibers putting a scratch in and you've also got the abrasives putting a scratch in. So now you do have a deep hologram. Now it will be a lot of work to take it out using an orbital polisher in a second step. Okay, so that's the rotary. Now the next tool I'm gonna talk about here is the beast, okay? so. I have one of the original Beast tools here. This is called the Flex XC3401. Craig, could you go grab, I got two books in there. One's on the Flex, one's on the Rupes. Anyway, this tool is easily identifiable because it's got this exposed aluminum head. And if you've ever used one of these a lot, you notice if you touch it after you've been buffing for power, it gets kind of hot, so don't touch it. Uh, <laughs> but the thing I want to show people about this is first of all, thank you, first of all, when we talk about orbit stroke length, and here's the chance where you might be able to zoom in. I'm going to bring this thing up to speed, and if you look carefully, you're going to see two perimeter circles, an outer perimeter and an inner perimeter, and the distance between them is 8 millimeters. That's the orbit stroke length. Does that show up, Craig? You zoomed in? Okay, so there's the outer perimeter, inner perimeter, and it's kind of hard to see because... It's not very big. Eight millimeters is not very big. But when we talk about orbit stroke length, and when I get over here to the Bigfoot 21, you're going to see that grow, and you'll see what I mean. But that's how I teach people in our classes what's meant when someone says an orbit stroke. It's got an eight millimeter. It's got a nine millimeter. It's got a 15 millimeter. That's what that means. Okay, now when you first buy one of these, here's my advice, and I did include this in my book. I wrote a book for the Flex Power Tools. I forget what page it's on. But when you buy it brand new out of the box, Take it apart and take some air tool oil or some 3 on oil. And this is a little felt ring in here. And you want to take and lubricate the ring. Now, Flex says you don't need to do this, but uh, I mean, I'm not going to go against anything they say, but let me show you what happens if you don't do it. Here is a brand new backing plate. And if you look right here, this is what rides on that felt ring. It's shiny plastic. Okay. Here's one that I've used before I lubricated the felt. And it is... It is completely dulled and marred up. And as I was pushing down, little pieces of plastic were flying out. So if you lubricate it, you won't scar it, and you won't have pieces of plastic flying out. If you don't lube it, you're going to wear out your backing plate and have little plastic pieces flying out on the paint as you're trying to buff it. So uh, take my word for it or not, uh, but that's how it works. And just make sure that anytime you dis dismantle one of these things, do not lose the bolt and do not lose the washer. The washer is extra thick, so it won't cave in like a normal washer. And the bolt is precisely long enough to give good attachment strength to the backing plate, but not so loose that these exposed gears could back out and strip. So you want to make you don't want to use an oversized bolt. You don't want to use an undersized bolt. So don't lose the factory bolt and the factory washer. Okay, that's what I got for a flex. Okay, so next I've got, um, I'm missing a tool. Can you walk around and go grab me a cordless beast? I thought I had one up here. It's okay, I can get one. Uh, they're back there if you want to go get one. It'll say Sea Beast. Okay, so there's three beast tools, and I'm happy to say that um, it's, it's not that I want to brag about it, but I named the beast because when I first wrote this book, uh, whenever you write a book and you go to a big show like SEMA, usually you sign it and you have what's called a ditty, a little slogan. And the first time I went to sign it, the first time I was going, hmm, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? What am I going to say? And I thought, I know, this tool is a beast. So that's how I signed it. The Flex 341 is a beast. Master the beast, Mike Phillips. So that's how I always sign my beast tools. And um, 
And then they introduced the sea beast. Okay, so this is the cordless version. And I nicknamed it the sea beast because I type a lot of articles and I didn't want to type out cordless beast, cordless beast. So I just shortened it and I added the letter C to beast. That's where it got the name sea beast. So then, then they brought out, this came out after the original beast. Then they brought out the super beast. Can you zoom in on that? So people can see how to spell it. It's not super, it's ghetto. It's supa, the supa beast okay so let me tell you the difference between the beast the super beast and the sea beast it has to do with the opm and the rpm i'm going to look over here because i got it written down the beast is 480 opm with 9600 rpm the super beast is 400 and do i have that backwards oh, i have that backwards okay the beast is 480 rpm and 9600 opm the super beast is 430 rpm and 8600 opm and the cordless beast is the least powerful of all it's 380 rpm and 7600 rpm okay so and the flex engineers they knew that if they made this the same gear ratio as the corded beast it would just run the battery down so i always run into people that want to know why are the other tools less powerful well sometimes just give the engineer credit maybe they actually know what they're doing okay so it, it has less OPM and less RPM, so the battery runs longer. It's not as powerful tool. If you need a more powerful tool, get one of the corded tools. It's still a great tool. Now, the thing about the OPM, and it has less RPM and less OPM than the original, and the reason why is because a lot of people complained that the beast, well, it was the beast. So it's lighter, quieter, cooler, smoother. Repeat after me. Four things. Lighter, quieter, cooler, smoother. Four new improvements besides the over-molded head, and now the aluminum head is still there, but it's covered up by plastic so you don't burn yourself. But lighter, quieter, cooler, smoother. Part of that comes from lower RPM, lower OPM. So, you know, pick your poison. If For me, I usually grab the beast because I want to go as fast as I can, and I like the 480 RPM and the 9600 OPM. I want to plow through a car, but keep my quality high. And one of the things that's nice about a gear-driven tool, whether it's the Rupes Mille, the, the uh, Makita PO 5000C, any of the Flex Beast tools or the new Harbor Freight Hercules, if any gear-driven tool you have is one of the things that makes it faster than a free-spinning tool is if you want to, after you put your abrasive technology down, you can push on it and the pad won't stall out so you can push harder, move the tool faster, and buff out a car faster. Been doing this for a long time, so I'm pretty confident in what I'm saying here. With free spinning tools, even if we're talking about the, the Porter cable, as soon as you push down on it hard, the pad will stall out. So you can't push down on it hard, so you can't engage the abrasive, so you can't go faster. So just a little bit of difference there. Anyway, so there's rotary. There's the three beast tools. Now, down here, this, I always forget the name of this because I always tell tool companies to give things a, a name, a nickname, like Rupes gave their tools Bigfoot or the Mille or the uh, Duetto, you know, it's named after a, uh, a Italian uh, sports car, um, Alfa Romeo. So give it a name. And they brought this out. I forget what it is, but, but both these companies jumped on these micro tools. Here's, here's the Rupes version. By the way, notice the white plastic caps. These were both prototypes that these companies sent me to test out. You turn this one on. This is a, woo, this is a 12 millimeter free spinning random orbital tool. Let me turn the speed down on this. And let me show you what 12 millimeter looks like. Okay, see the see the inner perimeter and the outer perimeter? That's 12 millimeters. Okay. Okay. And flex did the same thing. This is there's the outer perimeter, the inner perimeter. That distance there is 12 millimeters. And I've been told I think this is going to be discontinued. One of the reasons it's going to be, if it is, if that's true, is just simply because it's, it's a tool that's hard to maintain pad rotations for effective and speedy defect removal. And one of the things that I shared in my Rupes book, I'm not sure which page it was on, but I talked about the cause of pad stalling. And um, there you go, Rupes. And notice, notice when I wrote this, it's not how to use Rupes polishers, it's how to use the Rupes Bigfoot paint polishing system because they actually made a system. It's not about this book was never about a tools about their system, which is a great system. Um, but here's what I told people when it comes to free spinning tools. And here's the Bigfoot 21. Let me turn this on and you can check out the orbit stroke length. So here's the outer perimeter. Here's the inner perimeter. Look how big that stroke is. But that's what they mean when they say orbit stroke length. It's that length. It's the length of the orbit, the diameter 
of the orbit. But as soon as you go with a large stroke tool and the pad, what happens is the outer edge of the pad has leverage over the reciprocating drive unit in the center. Bigger the pad, think of like a stick and a fulcrum. You're trying to lift a log up. You know, if you got a little, if you got a long stick going to, to a rock, you put that over a log and then you got a tiny little stub there to try to push on, you're not going to be able to lift the rock up. But if you have the, 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 the lever close to the rock and a big old long chunk of, you know, handle coming out their side, you can easily push down on it, leverage it and move that rock. So this leverage, same kind of idea here applies here. The larger the stroke, usually the larger the backing plate the tool comes with, which means you can turn and turn a larger pad, but now the outer edge of that pad has leverage over the reciprocating component of the tool. Um, anyway, so just real quickly, this is a 12 millimeter, and um, I've, I've never really used this tool that much, mostly because I just, I don't like struggling to maintain pad rotation. Um, and if you want one, you better get one because I heard you're going to discontinue it. Okay, now we're going to jump over here to the Rupas 15 and 21. So these are what are called free spinning random orbital polishers. Now notice when I talked about the beast tools, I never used the word random. This is an eight millimeter gear driven orbital polisher. There's no randomness in there because there's a set of gears that are going to exactly cause that pad to oscillate in the same pattern no matter why. When you go to a free spinning tool, because of the way you hold it or, or the speed you're on or the shape of the panel, the oscillating pattern can change. So it's random. It's a random orbital because it's a free spinning tool. So there's the difference between gear driven and free spinning is that random aspect. Okay, so when they brought these out and... Uh, I think it's Kevin Brown that gives credit for it, kind of introducing these in America. He's been doing this a lot longer than me, so he should know. But the whole theory was is when you have a long stroke orbital polisher is what's happening is the pad movement is moving your braces over a larger area at the same amount of time as a short stroke. So it's doing more work, therefore it's faster. And with that kind of philosophy going taking place, you don't have to push down. You're counting on the long travel motion of the long stroke orbit tools to move the abrasives to do the defect removal quickly. So that's what it's all about. And apparently it, it does seem to work. I've, I've used these since they were introduced to America. Uh, this, by the way, is, let me look on here. This is the number 16 Mark II given to me by Rupas at SEMA. And this is the number six, number 15 given to me uh, at uh, SEMA by Rupas. So I've had these for a long time and they still go strong. Uh, the blue tape is actually, when I used to be at AutoGeek, we had so many tools there that I just identified this as mine. So if I saw somebody walking out of the building with it, I could say, hey, enjoy my personal Rupes. You know? <laughs> okay, so those are long stroke, free spinning tools. Um, over here is the Rupes Duetto. And this again is a prototype that Rupes sent to me. And uh, all my tools still work. This is, this is 12 millimeters. So let's look at the orbit stroke length. Here's the inner perimeter. Here's the outer perimeter. That's 12 millimeters. And when this tool came out, I really wanted to like it because, look, it looks a lot like the Porter Cable, which, you know, millions, if not billions of cars have been de-swirled with this simple wood sander. Um, but I just struggled, you know, to maintain pad rotation. So um, I haven't tried one of the newest ones um, for a long time. I'm sure with everything Rupes makes, it's improved. I'm sure it's a better tool nowadays. Um, I kind of wish they would have just brought out like an 8 millimeter or 9 millimeter, and it probably would have had better pad rotation because of the leverage factor of the outer edge of the pad. Uh, this is the Rupes Mini, which I kind of already showed you. Again, another free spinning tool. This is also, uh, I think, 12 millimeter. Okay, now we're going to jump over here. Griots, for years, uh, Griots and Meguiar's actually both introduced the Porter Cable sometime back in the 1980s. And I've got this article that's been around for about 15 years that talks about uh, the Porter Cable and what it was is a wood sander. It came with a vacuum um, attachment here and you could hook it up to a vacuum and as you're sanding wood, you could extract the dust and make it really safe for breathing. And it was a wood sander. And then somebody at Meguiar's and somebody at Griots, they happened to find out that they could put a, instead of a sanding disc, they could put a buffing pad on there and you could buff out paint. And, and kind of the primary difference that a lot of people don't understand is when it comes to wood sanders, most of them are pneumatic. They're air powered. Well, if, and, and I've been asked this question a lot. People go, well, hey, Mike, I don't got a Porter cable or any of these other things, but I've got this DA sander. Can't I use it to polish up the car? 
No, because it won't maintain pad rotation. So this was the only wood sander at the time that you could also sand wood with, but once you put a foam pad on there, it would maintain pad rotation. So that's why Meguiar's and um, Griot's Garage introduced it to the paint polishing world. But the other key thing about that is, is even if, if, uh, if you can understand the concept of having a, a pneumatic or air powered DA sander, a lot of people don't have a big air compressor, but anybody can plug this into the wall. So it opened up paint polishing to the world, at least the United States world that runs on 110 volts. Um, anyway, so, uh, so Griot's Garage, they had a copy of this, and everybody called it the GG6, the Griot's Garage 6. And this is kind of funny. The reason they called it a 6 is because it came with, uh, one second, it came with a 6-inch backing plate. Let me grab one to show you the difference here. Where's my backing plate? So, okay, here is a 6-inch backing plate. So everybody called it the GG6, which meant Griot's Garage 6-inch. But but they should have never named it like that, just like a lot of companies named their tools wrong. Here's a 5-inch, here's a 6-inch. You can see the huge difference in it. But this is the Griot's Garage GG6 was an 8-millimeter free-spinning random orbital polisher, just like the Porter Cable. So they should have called it the GG8, okay, for 8 millimeters, because the backing plates you can change. I could put a 3-inch, I could put a 5-inch, and put a 6-inch on there. So it's a relative number. But anyway, that's all history, but they did that. So um, going back to the GG6. So after a few years, they wanted to upgrade, so they brought out the Griot's Garage G9. So this is a 9-millimeter orbit stroke length. And if I come in here and let's see, there we go. Here's a perimeter, there's a perimeter, and that's about nine millimeters. That's the orbit stroke length. And this was kind of a unique tool when they brought it out. One of the things that made it unique is you could unplug the power cord for storage. Um, it's very versatile, smooth, lightweight, uh, but you're back to another free spinning. That's how I show people free spinning. It's a free spinning random orbital polisher. And I'll talk about this in a second, but that's one of the things about a free spinning random orbital polisher, unlike a gear driven orbital polisher, is there's always that chance for the pad to not oscillate or rotate or both. And they, most people call that pad stalling. So you always got to look at it. Okay, then over here, I forgot this one, but this is the this is the flex finisher. So this is a 15 millimeter. 15 millimeter, and here you can see the outer perimeter, inner perimeter. 15 millimeter, free spinning, random orbital polisher. And I just want to throw something your way. They call this tool officially the finisher. Okay, now let's compare and contrast that. They don't call it the heavy duty oxidation remover or the heavy duty swirl remover. It's the finisher. So it's a 15 millimeter free spinning tool that they decided to call the finisher because it's primary purpose is more for finishing, not doing heavy duty correction work. Okay. That would be another tool. Okay. So that kind of goes over here with the flex collection. <laughs> this is also a prototype too. It might be hard to see, but it's two different colors of red. I got this as a prototype. I got a lot of prototypes up here. Okay. So we talked about the G9. So let's go down here to the lowly Porter cable. And I kind of talked about it already. It started out its life as a wood sander, someone found out it can maintain pad rotation. And I just wanna show you something that, here's what most people do when they're using the Porter cable or any free spinning type tool. You take and you attach your pad, and the method I use is take your thumb and bring your thumb in contact with the backing plate as you start to load this down, because I'm old and shaky. I'm not that shaky, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and But at least if I'm shaking, and once my thumb's attached here, they're shaking in unison. But you're trying to bring this down and guide it and center it because no matter what kind of tool you're using, it's just so important to perfectly align that pad to the backing plate for maximum efficiency, maximum performance, least amount of vibration. But here's what most people do, is they take a Sharpie marker, which I know I have one up here somewhere, amongst all my stuff. Where is my Sharpie? Oh, here it is. Take a Sharpie marker, and you mark the side of your pad or you mark the back of the backing plate. And the reason for that is so your eyes can more easily monitor pad rotation or pad stalling. And the way that works is if I didn't mark this, it'd just be a, when it's spinning or jiggling, it's just a yellow blur. It's hard to tell, is it rotating or is it you know, stalling out? Once you put the mark on there, now you can easily see, you know, is it rotating or is it stalling out, okay? so. And then when you see if it's stalling out, then that tells you there's a couple of things you can do. You can bring your speed up. 
uh, you can try holding it at a different angle. Maybe you don't have the pad flat to the surface. More pressure on one side of the pad will cause the pad to stall out. And also, as pads become wet, so think about it. Say I'm compounding this beautiful 1970 charger back here. Say I add three peanut-sized drops of compound. I put it down and buff. I come back and put three pea-sized drops of polish and come back and buff. And pretty soon, at that moment, when you put the pea-sized drop on there and put it against the paint, foam does what it nat naturally does. It absorbs some of it, plus that violent oscillating action causes the liquids to migrate into the pad. Pretty soon you do a fender or two and this pad is saturated, it becomes wet. And all these free spinning tools will maintain pad rotation better if it's a clean dry pad versus a wet saturated pad. So one of the things you can do if you start to see your pad rotation, pad oscillation fall off on a free spinning tool, no matter what the brand, switch to a dry pad. Okay. Uh, let's see this. I just wanted to bring this up. This is, they call this the GG three because it takes, it has a three inch backing plate, but it's a five millimeter. So they should have called it the GG five. But for years when this thing was still available, I told people to buy one and people would always come back and say, well, Mike, it's not very good at paint correction because it won't maintain pad rotation, pad oscillation very well. And I says, well, don't buy it for that. I use it as a sander, okay, as a micro sander. Here's a three inch interface pad. Here's a piece of 2,500 grit sanding disc. Now you've got a great compact sander. And then they took this thing off the market. The last time I saw one of these for sale was up on e eBay for 165 bucks new in box. So you can still find them, but they do get your premium price. And it's a handy little tool. Just don't use it for paint correction, use it for sand. I mean, if you don't do sanding then, but I showed people how to use this for headlights sanding down headlights. Um, now, Grios or Maguire or uh, Flex introduced this. It's called the PXC80. And this is what I show now for machine dry sanding or machine wet sanding if you're doing boats or cars. And what made this unique was when they first brought this out, it came with three drive units. It came with the rotary, three millimeter and 12 millimeter. So rotary would be direct drive, three millimeter and 12 millimeter would be free spinning random orbital, just like these other random orbital polishers here. And I, I looked at this and everybody goes, wow, that's a great idea. And I go, that's a great idea. That's my new sander. You know, the first thing I thought about, but the problem was, is you can't sand in rotary mode because that's called grinding. And if you, if you tried to maintain pad or sanding disc rotation with the three millimeter, it just didn't have the power because there's, uh, the, these things have a counterweight. What the counterweight does is builds up inertia and inertia helps them maintain pad rotation, but the three millimeter just didn't develop enough inertia because the counterweight's so small. The 12 millimeter was better at maintaining pad rotation because the larger counterweight, that's better inertia. But now you've got something with this huge orbit stroke and you can't send next to a raised body line or an edge without hitting the raised body line or hitting the edge. And then when you come back and buff out your sanding marks, you burn through the edge. So I contacted Chris Metcalf and said, hey, could you have your engineer buddies make me a six millimeter? This is the this is the original one. You can see I just wrote six on there with the Sharpie marker because the new ones here, I'll show these both up. The, the ones that are, oh, th this is, these are both. Uh, but the new ones, the ones that they're making nowadays, it's actually imprinted onto the housing. These are both prototypes they sent me. I can't believe I still got two of them. People always want to borrow them from me and never give them back. But the six millimeter enabled you to sand close to an edge without standing on the edge and it had enough counterweight to maintain standing disc rotation. So just a couple of things to keep in mind, but that is the Pixie. And of course the Pixie also has this cool little tool here. It's called the Flexi, the Flex Flexi shaft. And of course with this, now you can take an get into tight areas like underneath the door handles or remove fingernail marks. Okay, so moving right along, I think we've covered all these tools. We get down here, there's the Udos. This is the Udos five in one, okay? And what this does is it offers rotary mode, eight millimeter for sanding, 12 millimeter, 15 millimeter, and 21 millimeter for paint correction. And it's, it's an actual, an engineering marvel how they designed this so you just adjust the collar to change the different actions. And at the same time, it's completely balanced. And so uh, hats off to Lake Country. You know, a lot of people talk about doing something. They put their money where their mouth is and they actually brought it out. And now they've got the new Udos 3-in-1, which is rotary. I think it's rotary, 8 millimeter, and 15 millimeter. I could be wrong on the 15. I'm not sure. So in Lake Country, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and I've used that tool at Seaman. I thought it was a much improved version of this. You get three tools in one. And then if we look down here, this is something nobody's probably ever seen before. Uh, Bob Eichelberg gave me this to test for Rupes, and it looks like something like a cyclo. Let me turn it on here. <laughs> and uh, 
I tested it, and I just thought, you know, um, I'm probably one of the only guys in modern history that have taught full-on classes with cyclo tools. When I was back at the Geek, I had 24 of them, and I would bring in big cars like this, two, sometimes three at a time, put a cyclo into everybody's hands and teach them how to use the cyclo, a real cyclo class. And, um, and even back then, when I hold the cyclo, because of the way the pads are oriented, there's a couple dynamics going on here that, for me, it just didn't work. One, instead of monitoring you know one pad you know or let me get a bigger one instead of monitoring one pad now you got to monitor two pads and and when you're going side to side you got good coverage because both pads are affecting the paint but as soon as you start going up and down now you got the space in the center that's not getting buffed at all so then you have to cant it you know or, or tilt it it just was too much work for me to use the cyclo and also to use this tool so after I reviewed it, I kind of gave it a thumbs down. And I think they may actually sell this in Europe or the UK. I'm not sure, but it never made it to the US market. And then I wanted to bring this out because this is, this is what's called a TOB, okay? Traditional orbital buffer, or some people call it the steering wheel buffer because it's like got a steering wheel. And these things basically have one speed. And yet what you do is you change bonnets out. You can get different bonnets like a wool bonnet, microfiber bonnet, cotton bonnet, and you change the bonnet depending on what you want to do. They're one speed, so there's nothing to adjust there. And let me tell you, these were popular back in the 1940s, the 1950s, even the 1960s, because back then the paint we had was single stage, and single stage would oxidize, so it'd get chalky looking. And you could take a tool like this and think about how big those cars were. Big old 1949 Dodge Wafer, big old rounded fenders. But you could throw a compound on here, turn this on, it would chew that compound right off. Swip to a different bonnet, throw some wax, and now you can wax it. So on the old single stage paints, they actually work pretty good. As soon as we went to modern clear coats, because the paints, generally speaking, get harder, and the pad's so big and the OPMs are so slow, they really become what we call wax spreaders. They're just really good for spreading wax. And I've been packing this around for probably 20 years because when I used to teach all these classes at, um, at uh, McGuire's, you know, you bring everybody in, you go through a PowerPoint. I call those academic classes. You go through a PowerPoint, you talk about the credibility of the, the family business and all that's some good stuff. But at some time, you start talking about the tool they sold, which originally was a Porter Cable. Then they renamed it with the sticker and called the G100. Then they redesigned it and brought it out as the MT300, which is still an 8 millimeter free spinning random orbital polisher. But you don't want to get this tool in there. But somebody in the class, and I taught hundreds of classes in Irvine, California for all the car coats. But it, inevitably, someone would always say, hey, Mike, I don't got that Meguiar's polisher, but I got one of these. You know, Can't I use this? And the answer is always a very polite no, you know, you can spread a coat of wax out with it. I'm trying to protect these. I only got a few of these left. Um, but they're pretty much useless as far as taking swirls and scratches out of modern clear coat. So thus, the traditional orbital buffer, the TOB, is a wax spreader or a um, door block. Keep the door open. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that's kind of what I got. These are the tools. Um, let me talk about short. I did talk about short stroke and long stroke um, and also hard paint and soft paint. Um, I think, this is my own experience, if you're working on a show car, a black show car, and you want to get the ultimate finish, for the finishing step, nothing beats a 21 millimeter free spinning random orbital polisher with great abrasive technology and of course matching the pad to the process that you're doing. Um, if you're trying to look for speed, uh, then a gear driven tool, you're not gonna have to monitor pad rotation. Uh, but the short stroke, the thing I like about short stroke is a lot of times um, I will grab the Porter cable just because it's got the eight millimeter short stroke and it has a smaller pad. There's less leverage of the outer edge over the reciprocating component. It's just easier to maintain pad rotation without thinking about it. And that kind of brings me to something that I teach in all my classes. And that's when you're using a free spinning tool versus a gear driven tool. Let me hold up the cordless beast here. So listen to this, you can hear the gears, okay? so gear driven there's no black mark on the backing plate and you don't need to mark the pad and here's the difference between using this and a free spinning tool i'll pick on the porter cable with the porter cable or any free spinning tool what most people do is they mark the side of the backing plate or the pad 
so their eyes can see if the pad's actually rotating and oscillating. And if not, then they can change what they're doing. But doesn't that mean, say if it's going to take me four hours to compound this car, doesn't that mean for four hours I got to look down and go, is the pad rotating? Is the pad rotating? Is the pad rotating? Is the pad rotating? For four hours, okay? You try, grab a gear-driven tool. You don't got to do that. Turn it on and go. You don't got to look. It's going to rotate no matter what because it's gear-driven. So for me... You know, a lot of people think I'm a big flex fan, and I like flex tools, so I'm not saying I'm not, but I'm an eight millimeter gear driven orbital fan. You know, if other companies would have brought out eight millimeter instead of four millimeter, five millimeter, I'd probably use and love their tools, but they didn't. They brought out shorter stroke gear driven orbitals, and I just find they yank me around too much, so I stick with the eight millimeter. Um, I have not tried the Harbor Freight Hercules, which is a exact knockoff of the Rupes 3401. Um, you know, so, um, I, all the reviews I've seen are good for it. It costs a lot less, but you know, it is German is the Mercedes Benz of polishers. Harbor Freight is the, is usually the lower end, but Hey, if it works, it works. Uh, I think that's all I got for you. <laughs> so, Oh, hard paint, soft paint. Someone had asked about this in the comments. When would you choose one tool over the other? Great question. You know, years ago I was asked to, um, uh, detail, a uh, museum car. It was sold. It was sat in a museum for 20 years. It was a Ferrari. I think it was a P3 or P4. I can't remember. But it was one of three built. Very, very rare. Very swoopy, very beautiful, single stage red paint. And of course, when I got there, it completely scratched up. And I, I, I compounded it with the Beast, and then I polished it with the Meguiar's MT300, which is a, uh, or actually it was the G100, which is their version of the Porter Cable, so free-spinning 8 millimeter. And someone in this thread in the comments said, Mike, we noticed you started with the Beast, but you finished out with the Porter Cable. Why did you do that? And the answer is, is because when it comes to softer paints, generic, you know, just uh, generally speaking, a free-spinning random orbital polisher will finish out nicer, more consistently, on softer paints than any gear driven tool. So there is a time to go to uh, soft paints. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a 1969 GTO in here and um, I, I, uh, I finished it out with the Beast, but, but that's because I'm using great abrasive technology. The Dr. Beasley's NSP45 worked great on that. But if I ran into any kind of troubles, I would have switched over to a free spinning tool and it would have helped with that problem of micro marring on soft paint. Not because the products I was using are bad, but because the paint is soft, very delicate. That's all I got. <laughs> all right, Mike. And uh, okay, ready for some questions? Three, four, five, six prototypes up here from over Very the nice. all still operating. Pretty cool. Awesome. Can you hear me, Mike? I can hear you. Okay, excellent. Let's do some questions then. Um, everybody, this is Victor. I'm the communications manager for Dr. Beasley's, uh, and I'm going to be the resident voice from the nether uh, for this session. Uh, so let's start off with our chats. Uh, so we got Noah Guy Mobile detailing in the chat. Oh, yeah, let's go. Good to see you, Noah Guy. Um, first from Puerto Rico. Good to see you, Umberto. Um, Robert Lara. Hey, from Soggy San Diego. Kyle Niveau says, let's see how much this video is going to cost me. <laughs> we have a class come up in San Diego. It's March 23rd and 24th. All hands on. No chairs, no PowerPoint, no sitting. Working on cars. Okay, this is a good question from uh, Barry DeHart. He wants to know, how can you use a rotary and not make a mess? Oh, I, uh, years of practice. You know, uh, when I got my start, I splatter stuff everywhere. But I'll give you a couple techniques. Um, uh, Victor, maybe that's something we should do uh, in the next couple weeks. I got some black cars coming in. Not that the color matters, but there's a technique called picking up your bead using the 10 at 10 technique. Mm -hmm. But uh, for boat detailing, what I show people when you're working on a vertical surface, sure, you can slap a strip of product up there and pick it up using the 10 at 10 technique. But usually it's just faster and easier just to take and put a circle of product in the center of the pad. Don't put it out here because when you turn that on, it's just going to fly out. But it put it right here tight around the circle push it against the pad, kind of smoosh it around, turn it on, slow RPM, and start spreading that product out, then go up on edge, and you won't be throwing splatter everywhere. The 10 at 10 technique um, is where you lay down a strip of product, and basically you look at this thing like it's a clock. So here's midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and so on. And what you're going to do is if you look at this, let me turn this to the low speed and lock it. When you turn this, this thing from where you're looking is spinning clockwise, and if I bring this around, that means if I bring that strip of product in at 10 o'clock, 
it's going to pull it into itself instead of throwing it everywhere. So what you do is you put down a strip of product on the hood or the roof of the trunk lid. You lay this down flat on the paint, pick this side up, the 10 o'clock side up about 10 degrees, thus the 10 at 10, running it at 10. As soon as you get past it, you lay that pad down flat, spread it around, start buffing. I demonstrate and teach this in all my classes. We just had one here Saturday. This is one of the cars left over. It's a 70 Charger. The class did one-step paint correction line. We had a 34 a Plymouth four-door suicide door street rod with just hammered paint, and the class learned how to use the rotary polisher with wool pads on it. It was a real challenge, but it really gave people a lot of um, time behind the polisher because it has a lot of curves to it, so they're always adjusting how they hold that tool. But that's how you, you do that. You put it in the center of the pad or learn how to do the 10 at 10 technique. And then when you get really good at the 10, 10 at 10 technique, it's actually relative. Um, you just got to understand which way the pad is spinning, but instead of, uh, instead of picking it up at 10, you could pick it up at four, but just tilt it this way and come in and the pad will pull it into itself. So it becomes relative. You can pick up your bead this way. 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 All you got to do is spend some time behind the tool and you can make a dance on paint. Awesome. Okay. We've got <laughs> brother Blackie here saying hello from Australia. Hello, brother Blackie. Hey. Uh, we got Justin Gaddy back in the chat. Learning more knowledge from the great one. Thanks for another great live. Thank you. Blue Justin. collar working class dog. <laughs> <laughs> woof, woof. Uh, Mr. K says uh, another awesome session. Question. Uh, working on single stage paint, how can you tell how much material you have to work with and how aggressive you can go? Thank you, Mr. Goat. Um, it, it helps have a paint thickness gauge, but the thing about a paint thickness gauge is it measures total film build. And uh, so it's going to tell you how much uh, primers there, how much base coats there, how much feathers or a feather fill or uh, uh, bondos in there, and then how much clears on there. So it's just going to give you what I call a big picture idea. I use a paint thickness gauge, and I show this in my classes as a go or no go decision maker. If I measure the paint on a factory finish and it's four below, I really don't want to compound it. You know, I'll polish it, but. Who knows how thick that paint is? It's probably pretty thin. If it's four, five, and above, then usually if it needs compounding, I'll do it. But I always use great abrasive technology. I've never once in my life have I used junk, and there's still junk on the market today. But you don't know, so you just, you know, look. Match the right tool to the job. Use great abrasive technology. Match the pad to the process, and then cross your fingers. <laughs> you know, by the way, this, uh, I was told when this arrived, this had the original paint. It actually doesn't. It has an old old repaint and it is single stage there's lacquer checking in it and when it got here the first thing i did is i came up here and pointed to the owner where the where this raised body line the paint's already been burnt through so my students didn't do it it came that way and the owner saw it and recognized he already knew about it and then what i taught the class as i taught the class anytime you're buffing on any car base coat clear coat or single stage buff up to an edge but don't buff on an edge buff up to a raised body line but don't buff on the raised body line and one of the biggest reasons for that is look this is an old car um the owner thinks it was painted like maybe 20 years ago we have no idea who's buffed on this before us now if it was some caveman hack detailer using rocks in a bottle on a wool pad and rotary and he didn't burn through all the rest of the raised body lines or edges the paint could be what i call whisper thin and i come by using great pad great tools great abrasive technology real careful touch and i go through with one pass was it my fault or the other guys. It's the other guys from which much paint, but I'm the one's gonna take the blame. So that's why I teach people buff up to an edge, don't buff on an edge, because you don't know who buffed out that car before you, and they may have left you whisper thin paint. You can actually Google whisper thin and Mike Phillips and pull my article up on that. <sighs> okay, uh, got Daniel Kinder here. Uh, love the little duetto, but you just can't beat the 7424 XP Porter cable. Best little DA ever made, in my opinion. Uh, what did he say there, Craig? Yeah, this is the Porter Cable 7424 XP. The previous versions were the 7424 or the 7336. Uh, the difference was, I think, one came with a larger backing plate or it came with a vacuum attachment. I can't remember. But then they upgraded it. They added about 50 cents worth of parts, made it a little bit better tool. Uh, it is a better tool. The XP is better than the predecessors. But they're still, to me, they're considered one of the safest tools out there. About the only way you could ever get in trouble with this is if you actually physically held it over the car and dropped it. <laughs> and I used to show this on TV. I did this with Brian Fuller one time. This is how safe this thing is, okay? It's, I also did this on a TV show one time. 
I turned this sucker up. This is going to hurt a little bit because there's no compound on here. But live on camera, I did this. You know, no, no blood. <laughs> so pretty safe tool. And one thing I want to uh, point out, if you're new to the rotary polisher, one of the ways that you can get into learning how to use this is use a smaller pad. So throw in a smaller backing plate. In fact, I got a smaller backing plate right here. That's not the right backing plate. Somewhere I had one here. I don't have one here. Uh, but put, yeah, I do right here. So here is a uh, four and three-eighths backing plate. And this would work well with like a five, five and a half inch pad. But you just have less material moving over the surface so it's easier for you to control. As you get confidence, then start moving up to larger pads. All right. Okay. Um, my guy Kirby wants to know, uh, as an owner of a recent production automobile, which orbit size is uh, recommended for DIY purposes? You know, um, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Uh, this is just going to be my opinion based on experience. Um, a well-made tool, it really, you could use a long stroke or a short stroke and a uh, free spinning tool and it'd get great results. Here's what I tell people. If you spend enough time behind the tool, you can make it dance on paint. So that's where people don't do that. They try it once and didn't like it if they would have spent more time with it. But I would say any of the shorter strokes, anywhere from eight, the Griot's Garage, nine millimeter, the Rupes, 15 millimeter, somewhere in that range. But really the key is, is after you purchase that tool, get quality pads, get good, good abrasive technology, and then go out into the garage and start working with it. Watch some YouTube videos, come to a hands-on class like ours, and uh, and you can't go wrong, you know. And then, you know, a lot of times people say, what's the best tool? And I would say the best tool is the first tool, then keep adding to your collection. You know, kind of like ladies accessorize, they buy a dress, then they buy a bracelet, then they buy a handbag, then a scarf and sunglasses. You know, don't just stop with one tool, get multiple tools as your experience and your comfort grows. I'm, I'm a big fan of rotaries for the, because I, <coughs> excuse me, I, I work on a lot of cars that are hammered. Um, I get asked to do custom sanding and polishing work where I need a rotary to pull up my sanding marks. But I also like it because I always machine scrub tires. I machine dress tires. I clean body cladding. You know, we had a class here this last weekend with the Honda CRV had all that plastic body cladding. Instead of taking a hand brush, I showed the, I showed the class how to take and throw this on a rotary and machine scrub that cladding and get it clean before we put a, a, a dressing on there. So my personal, if I had just had to pick two tools, I'd probably, if I could only have two, I'd pick a rotary and a porter cable because I can do everything with those two. So it's like a machine sand with the porter cable. I can pull out swirls with the porter cable. I can use a brush with the porter cable. Rotary will do all the heavy paint corrections. So if I had to just pick two, it'd be those two. I would never put myself in a hypothetical situation where I can only pick one. And if I had to, then it'd probably be the beast. All right. Uh, let's see. Borislav Seslija says, hi from Serbia. Welcome. Good to have you. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks for watching. Yeah, got Harry's power wash detailing saying great presentation as always. Thanks for watching, Harry. Neil says, always a pleasure to learn from Mike. I've been enjoying Mike teaching us about the NSP primers. Uh, got I, I worked on a Toronto. Ferrari over the weekend. Two Ferraris, actually, a, um, a 1966 and a 1967. They will be at the Cavallino Ferrari show this coming weekend if you want to walk around and see them. They're, they're hoping to get platinum um platinum uh, awards for these restorations uh but one thing i would say is that the the, the, the 1967 275 uh what is that one called gtb it's written down on my desk in there it's the four camera they call it a four camera it's got four overhead cams beautiful like maroon red paint that paint was like the gto very soft and i finished that out with the nsp45 perfect if you go to cavallino check it out all right. Um, let's see here. Oh, Renardo uh, from Oxon Hill, uh, Maryland says, if you have taken Mike's three-day class, sign up. It's worth it. And uh, I couldn't agree more. Thanks, Renardo. Renardo is a veteran of one or two of my classes, and he's also on our TV show. And a hardworking guy, super hardworking, honest guy. Awesome. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, Daniel Kinder uh, says, I'm working on a single stage white paint and it's pretty scratched up. What I'm doing with my DeFelsco DFT combo gauge and what I do is measure and keep an eye on it and never take away more than two tenths if there's over 2.5 mils or more. And I always keep checking the work area. If it's soft paint, I work the area larger and add just a little more paint than usual to add more lubrication or add and mix just a little more pure polish with my light cutting compound. 
Well, I tell you, Daniel, you're a better detailer than me. You can come more detail my car anytime. <laughs> I I would not have the uh, I would not have the uh, tenacity or the attention span to measure the paint so often. What I would use as I do is I'd do a test spot. I would pick the right tool for the job, the right product in the pad, and then cross my fingers and just use good technique. You know, just use good technique. I will tell you this: when it comes to single stage paint, and Toyota still paints a lot of their cars single stage white. Uh, that paint tends to be very hard because the pigment is titanium dioxide powder, which is a hard mineral, and therefore it makes the resin hard. The complete opposite is usually single stage black, where the pigment is carbon black. A, a simple example of that would be the soot on the inside of a barbecue. You lift the lid, don't do it when it's hot, and you pull that black stuff out. That's carbon black. It's very soft. So when you add that to a resin, paint is resin. It makes it very soft. But that's that's how uh, single stage paint and gel coat boats, by the way, because they've mixed the pigment with the resin. The pigment hardness or the pigment softness affects the overall hardness or softness of that coating. All right. Uh, Robert Lara says, uh, thoughts on Tesla paint. What What do you think is the best product to use? I've never no buffed out of Tesla. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've buffed out so many weird things in my life. And I've had a couple of people that have called me but never followed through. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if I may, I mean, I've heard, you know, often that uh, Teslas have really soft paint. So, you know, something like our NSP45, NSP95, that tends to be a pretty good starting point for soft paint. So, yeah, I think any of them will work good. What's funny is my wife calls them um, stops a lot. <laughs> <laughs> What's the, she said, oh, uh, she has another nickname for um, all electric cars, not just her. She calls them one way. <laughs> one way or stops a lot <laughs> so sorry i'm all a right. car breather guy <laughs> all right we got rick smith here uh asking what your thoughts are on the rupes rotary he's been thinking about getting it next i um when they first came out i they sent me one i wrote a review for it i thought it was a well-made tool uh i got nothing against the rupes rotary if i had one i'd use it i'd really like to see the cordless version since since flex brought out their cordless uh, rotary. I mean, I never grab a corded. The only time I grab a corded is if I'm doing glass polishing. By the way, there's a glass window back there. It's off a 1966 Hemi charger, one of like four built in the world. And I've been taking some scratches out using a very high speed flex rotary. Uh, but yeah, the Rupes makes good tools. I've been to the Rupes. I, I was actually uh, invited over there before they purchased the old cycle plant here in America. So what they used to do is they invite influencers over there. So I've been there. I was the guest speaker at their first annual sales meeting. And um, I got a tour of the whole factory. In fact, in my book, um, the Rupes Bigfoot Paint Polishing System, uh, Guido Valentini, the president of Rupes, personally took me through a tour of their building. And I took this picture on purpose. So that it's worth to see it. But um, when we went on the tour, um, he's there's a big uh, picture in the in the manufacturing plant that said no pictures. So it had a camera with the circle and the X through it. And he looks at it and he looks at me and says, "But for you, Mike, you can <laughs> take pictures." So here it is, right there. Can I zoom in on that? There's me. I'm handing him a copy of one of my books. And there's the no camera sign. I took that and then I started taking pictures. And I've actually got some pretty in-depth write-ups that show how they make all their tools in Milan, Italy. Of course, that's all relative now because they got a manufacturing plant here in the States. But uh, high quality tools, just like Flex. I mean, they make everything themselves, their own motors, everything. So uh, always love working with real manufacturers versus marketing companies. All right. Oh, man, we got Yancey Martinez in the chat here. Uh, Yancey <laughs> says, quit slacking, Mike Phillips. We're going to get you a Tesla to buff out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, listen, I'm taking me and Craig are doing your job for you. You've been replaced. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, erased. You've been erased. <laughs> <It's a nigger. laughs> erased the movie. Okay. Well, I think uh, we're just about out of questions here. So, I mean, we're coming up on the hour mark anyway. So, if you want to wrap things up, Mike. Sure. You know, um, uh, to, to me, like I said, when I started this out, there was this discussion going on. I think it was on detailing for money. Uh, someone brought my name into it. Uh, you know, there's kind of some strong opinions over different brands and different orbit strokes and free spinning versus rotary. And someone called me out in this thread and I just went up and said, hey, 
uh, I think you just choose the right tool for the job that matches your experience or your skill level. You know, it would be a foolish to tell somebody to go pull sending marks out of a car if they never used the rotary. So maybe they're more comfortable with a free spinning tool. But um, but I just, you know, it's the right tool for the job. Um, to me, uh, I'm going to pitch our classes. We got not, we just had one, so we got nine more for the year. And I used to teach what I call an academic class. I did that at McGuire's. I did it at Auto Geek. You come in, you take the chair, we go through a PowerPoint. It's a great way to learn. You learn through looking, listening, writing, hearing, you know, and I, I take notes. I'm a voracious note taker. I learn great by that way. But one of the ha things that happened is my classes, I started showing so many tools, so many products, so many pads, so many techniques that my PowerPoint slide went to 256 slides long for a three-day class so that's like 70 slides so from 8 30 in the morning till lunchtime you're sitting there looking at a powerpoint then we walk over and i got all these cool cars for the class to work on in no time so finally i just got to the point when i was doing my road show classes i said oh screw it i just didn't even take my laptop didn't bring a powerpoint says this is work on cars and and i found that the kind of people that are interested in learning how to machine polish the paint on a car like this or a Toyota Camry, they also, not always, but also tend to be the kind of person that learns better by doing, not looking at a PowerPoint for hours. So there's some great classes out there. I know all the guys that teach classes. If you go to their classes, in fact, I encourage you to. You're going to have a great time. You're going to learn a lot. But if you do find you're the kind of person that would rather just start out in the morning working on a car, then get signed up for our classes. Um, our two day and our three day and our even our one days, I start them at 7.30, you know, 7.30. Get here at seven, get your donuts and coffee because at 7.30 we go. And um, and there's no breaks. There's a small lunch break, but there's no like 10 o'clock smoke break. That, you need a break, go take one. I don't give a break. I'm a cruel taskmaster. But I walk around, you get plenty of one-on time with me and I monitor everything you're doing. I bring in the coolest cars for you to train on. Our three-day classes include dry sanding by hand or machine on some other dude's street rod to learn how to remove orange pill. The first day is all paint correction, multiple step, one step, one step, AIO, uh, extreme prep wash, glass polishing, engine detailing, wet wash engine detailing. So I think I cover more topics in a single day than a lot of classes teach in two and three days. You know, my sanding class, you learn everything in one day, you know, from start to finish, you know, uh, cleaning the car, claying the car, sanding the car, compounding the car, the wool pad, finishing out the orbital and put a ceramic coating on in one day. And I've been doing these for about 10 years and all the cars come out beautiful. And then the third day of our third day class is boat detailing. Craig's been through that class. And I bring in the worst condition dark color boats and show you how to make them look brand new. And for that, we actually go to wet sanding by machine using gear driven orbitals. So there's no sanding disc stalling. You can plow through a boat as fast as possible. But you can get more information about those classes up at drbeezys.com. I do have a three day class coming up in February. It's February 16th, 17th, and 18th. And again, call me 760-515-0444 uh, or go to Dr. Beasley for more information. You can also go to Google and type in this. If you want to see what our classes look like, this is so cool. Go up to Google, type in 600, the plus sign, pictures, and then add my name, Mike Phillips. And you'll pull up this article I wrote for the Dr. Beasley's blog. It has 601 pictures that completely show you everything you're gonna do in three days. Nobody in the industry does this. Nobody takes this many pictures and then shares it. So if you're gonna sign up for a class, you gotta be going, hmm, what do I get to do? You know, and you usually got a picture of one dude one guy standing there buffing on a hood and a bold point list. You know, here's what you get to do. But you come look at our classes, we show it, man. We show everything you get to do. And there's no chairs in the pictures. There's no PowerPoint in the pictures. So think that thing through. Before you sign up for every class, ask him, what kind of cars do you have? I'm the only guy in the industry that actually posts pictures of the cars you're going to work on before you pay for the class. So you know what you're going to work on. I've got a demo hood. It's over there. Don't use it in classes anymore. In fact, I found a picture back in AutoGeek. I said I had 18 demo hoods. All gone. All gone. It's cars. Cars, baby. It's how it rolls. So that's coming up. If you're going to Mobile Tech Expo, it's not this week. It starts next week. I'm teaching a detailing 101 class. All the pictures, most of the pictures, not all, come from my big three-day class. And so they're, they're, they're pictures showing what you need to do from start to finish the detail car as done in a real hands-on class. That's at Wednesday, January 31st. It starts at 1 p.m., goes to 1.45 or 2.45. It's about a two-hour class, and that's in the DeSoto three or DeSoto four room, but that's, that's a new thing they're starting at MT called Detailing 101. So they got six classes, six different instructors. I'm one of the people they asked to come teach a Detailing 101 class. And then 
Thursday, I got three classes, uh, Breakthrough Abrasive Technology with Dr. Beasley's NSP Primers, Glass Polishing, and one of my favorite classes to teach, How to Become the Recognized Expert in Your Home, Detailing Expert in Your Hometown. And it's, this, it's the method that I use to always be working on cool stuff versus grocery getters. Nothing wrong with grocery getters, done my share, but given the choice, I'd rather, you know, I've got a 1956 Chevy Bel Air coming in, black street rod swirled out. I'm going to love working on that. My wife wants me to do her SUV. I'm like, eh, you know, because eh, you're my wife, I'll do it. Because <laughs> I like working on cool stuff. But that class will teach you how to take the back door in instead of making a mistake like everybody else and trying to go in through the front door because it ain't going to work. It never has in the past. It ain't going in the future. Uh, other than that, Victor, I think I covered everything coming up. But yeah, we got 10 class. We got a big five-day class coming up that covers PPF installation, marketing, and business. You know, we got some some, uh, industry experts that are going to be there. That's going to be in Chicago. And that's a five-day class. But again, information on all those classes will be up at drbeasies.com, including the one coming up in Escondido, California, March 23rd and 24th. Awesome. All right. Besides well, that, think... if you like these videos, like, share, subscribe, you know, send them to your friends. You know, we had a very controversial one on leather last week. Week before we had hard paint versus soft paint. Today was tool time. There's always something fun and exciting going on in our live classes. And next week, by the way, we will be broadcasting live from Mobile Tech Expo. That'll be on Wednesday, and my class is Thursday, and also uh, some stuff that'll be on Friday and Saturday, which is actually the day of the show. The first day is uh, Wednesday is kind of a new thing. Thursday is what they call Education Day. Then the show actually is Friday and Saturday. Hope to see you guys there. Come by the Dr. Beasley's booth. Say hi to me, Chris Rakana, and all the rest of the team there. All right. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, say goodbye, Mike. <laughs> hey, goodbye, everybody. Take care.